uh, we are back in our series on uh, Mark. And um, this morning, the passage I want to focus on is, and I've tried to find a way to title it, it's Discerning Signs of a Loss of Spiritual Authority. Um, if you look at the passage, you will find that you can probably look at a few different aspects, but the one thing that stands out, the main issue is the question, uh, who has tr true spiritual authority? Now, this is a significant encounter. <coughs> uh, this is a significant encounter. Uh, we'll call it a confrontation, really, because uh, this is the first time we find there's an open confrontation that Jesus has with all three groups of religious leaders that make up what uh, the Jewish authority, uh, the religious authority known as the Sanhedrin. And so you'll find there are the scribes, and these are actually the accredited uh, teachers of Judaism. Uh, they were the chief priests, uh, the heads of the temple, and they were the elders who will generally be the community leaders. And, and these three groups form the highest authority in Judaism. And the reason they joined together to challenge Jesus is interesting, right? If you read through Mark, if you're going through, you find that Jesus had different encounters with different groups, sometimes one, sometimes two, but this is the first time everybody is there. And if you remember, if you can recall the last message, the last passage earlier to this, in Mark chapter 11, verse 15 to 19, you'll find it's because of Jesus cleansing the temple. When he cleansed the temple, that incident really, really riled everybody so badly that they actually got together. Again, for those who may not remember or, or were not here, I just want to quickly recall the, some background. Remember I mentioned that these three events, the cursing of the fig tree, how Jesus cleansed the temple, and then the lessons he explained connected with the wind tree, how the tree had died, are all connected. Basically, is this: it was a rebuke by Jesus that the temple and those who in, in the authority of the temple were spiritually dead, and therefore they would be judged. That's why he cleansed the temple. When he did it, he declared, really, that the temple is dead. If it's spiritually dead, it has lost its spiritual authority, and that is a very difficult thing for them to accept. <clears throat> now, the reason why spiritual authority is important is because you find that today in the church, when I say church in general, uh, there are times we find that uh, there's so much conflict, right? who is right, who is wrong, variety of opinions and teachings, and it can be very confusing. And um, of course, we know that the first principle we have to keep in mind, and we always know this, is, uh, you know, depends, right, whether they follow the Bible, right? If a person is faithful teaching the Bible, then we know that, you know, that's pretty safe. But the reality is, it, it gets very confusing. The, the Bible teaches certain principles and things, but in running everyday life, you find that actually it's quite hard, right? Because uh, how do you know? Uh, if you think about, for example, Apostle Paul, who he was the one who really knew God, right? Called by Jesus, and he was such a great scholar. <clears throat> he was well known. He was a rabbi of the highest order, achieved so much. And even he said in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, you read that passage, remember it's, it's the issue that's very difficult in the church. It's about the issue of divorce. It was the issue of um, what happens, you know, say that now the person becomes a Christian, you know, and then the spouse refuses to believe, and I'm, I don't agree, I don't accept. Because the principle really is that light and darkness should not be together. And he, and, and he actually said it twice, you see, uh, explained, he said, well, uh, in this matter, I, not the Lord, <coughs> this is what I say. And, and the reason simply is this, because uh, throughout the Bible, there is no particular direct teaching on that, Right? And so, but he was confident and said, look, I have nothing from the Lord. It's not there directly. God said, this is what you should do. But as someone who's followed the Lord and, and his apostle, uh, it's my opinion and, and I believe it is worthwhile. You see that? So he, he mentions a few of these things that this is how we should deal with it. And we find throughout our life, right, there is that issue, right? Sometimes we, we don't know. In practical things, what do we do? Uh, church says we should do this. And they said, no, what about this? And, and no one actually sometimes can say this is right or wrong. Uh, because they are both be right. But what is God saying, right? And then sometimes we find there are leaders who we, we, we believe and follow. And, and we do that because we, 
most of us, myself included, we don't have the expertise and the time and energy to scrutinize every single thing, right? Life goes on. <clears throat> and so what we do is we trust people who have reliable, good reputations. And then we look to them and say, well, I, I'm not sure, I don't have experience, and we ask for advice. What do you think? And, and they give advice, and we follow. But throughout the years, you notice that you will find that people I, you strongly follow and believe, and, and they've been trustworthy. And over the years, certain things happen, and then actually they have lost a spiritual authority, but we, we don't realize it, <coughs> and we follow. And then we realize years later, oh no, there was a problem. So what do we do? <coughs> so here I want to stress here is that this sermon is not about naming people and saying, oh, this is no good. It's not about judging everybody's spiritual authority of other people. It's not about who is right, who is wrong, you know, this is what you should do. It's not about who is more spiritual, who is less spiritual. Um, you know, that's not my place. And probably if you look at it, you know, I will see myself there, so not the way to go. But rather, really, the focus is just to remind ourselves of some of the signs of a loss of spiritual authority. <clears throat> so we recognize it and remember it's not just for you as members, you know, I'm, I'm not saying we use this to judge other people. It's also for me because sometimes we don't know <clears throat> that we actually drifted a little bit. Maybe it's not theological, not a doctrinal matter, to understand that, all right? But it is a matter that we are... Mm, on the danger zone. <clears throat> so, the important thing is really for this, so that if we, we go astray, we will realize it. And even if we don't, someone will gently point us back in love in the right direction. And by God's grace, we will all get back on the right track. Okay? So that's the, the basic idea here. So I want to look at the two questions asked in this confrontation. I call it confrontation because it really was. And it was all about religious authority. And to see what we can learn about spiritual, not religious authority, there's a slight difference. Okay? So the first question was this. You look at verse 28. This was directed by the religious leaders to Jesus. <clears throat> and this, this is what they said. And they said to him, by what authority are you doing these things? Or who gave you the authority to do them? What's this question about? The question is... Actually, for them, it's a rhetorical question. In other words, uh, <clears throat> when they ask the question, they don't really expect you to ex answer fully because in the question is a, an idea is we already know you have no authority. We are questioning your authority because we don't believe you have. We don't accept your authority. So who do you think you are to do this? Who gave you this authority? You're not following the rules of the game and of tradition. You don't have it. But what's interesting, you notice in verse 29 to 28, uh, to 29 to 80, 30, sorry, Jesus responds to them with another question. You know, Jesus is very good at doing that. You ask him a question, he responds to the question. And this is what he said. Jesus said to them, I will ask you one question. Answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I do these things. Was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? Answer me. Now, you can see now in Jesus' question, he's actually now throwing it back to them. <coughs> they are questioning his spiritual authority, and Jesus is questioning their spiritual authority. What, on what authority are you asking me this? <coughs> it's along the lines of this. If you claim to have this spiritual authority, then show it, prove it, by answering a simple question on how to discern spiritual authority. <coughs> because, remember, John the Baptist was doing this, and now I ask again, so was it real authority from God or was it a man's authority? <laughs> now they are in a dilemma. Okay? And if we look at the two answers, we find actually very interesting things happening. <clears throat> the answers talk about religious authority. Now, before it is, just listen into how they came up with the answer. That's very important. And we read this is what happened. And they discuss it with one another, saying, Now, if we say from heaven, he will say, Why then did you not believe him? Right? <clears throat> but shall we say, uh, From men? But they were afraid of the people, for they all held John was really a prophet. So now they are caught. 
You understand? So they are stuck now. And so they answered Jesus, ah, we don't know. And Jesus' response to them was this, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. So you see, what we see is, if, is that the answer was dishonest and evasive to the call. The essence is they refused to answer because to answer it would expose the hypocrisy and show that they really don't have any spiritual authority. And I'll get back to it a bit more later. <clears throat> but look at it first, that Jesus exposed their dishonesty by saying, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. In essence, Jesus was saying this along these lines. If you cannot be honest with your answer, because Jesus knows they, they have an answer. If you cannot be honest with your answer, you just don't deserve an answer from me. Why should I submit to your authority if you don't have any? You see the problem? <clears throat> you don't deserve an answer. But then Jesus, of course, wants to answer it because it's a very important issue. And so we read, he actually gives them an answer. But he chose to give an answer through a parable to everybody. So can you imagine now they're discussing with Jesus, challenging him. <clears throat> they discuss with themselves, they come back to him. I'm not giving you an answer, Jesus said. And he turns to everybody, and they are in the crowd. And he tells them this parable. Now, I won't read through the parable again, but you must understand a few interesting things about this parable. Just quick summaries, because that's not the focus here. It is Jesus' version, if you go and look at the Bible, Isaiah chapter 5, verse 1 to 7. It's a very, very famous part of Isaiah. It's the song of the vineyard. Okay, go back and read about it. And this song, this parable now, is really about this. It's about how God does everything possible for the vineyard Israel. God just loves and does everything for them. But it still produced wild grapes. In other words, not good fruit. No matter how much God had poured into them, fruit is useless. And so the vineyard gets destroyed. That's the basic of the song of the vineyard. And he's directed now, Jesus is using it and directing it to the priests, scribes, and elders. Because, as I mentioned before, they would know. They would know this parable. And they knew that Jesus was telling this parable to say, this is you. So let me quickly explain the different parts of the parable so that we see how it works. First of all, the landowner, the planter of the vineyard is God. Okay, very clear. The vineyard is Israel. The tenants... The farmers are the Jewish religious leaders. The landowner's servants are the faithful prophets and priests that God is sending over the years. The son, of course, is Jesus. And the others to whom the vineyard is given was the Gentiles. <coughs> and that's how the Gentile church began. Okay? Simple as that. Now, this is the main point. Their rejection of the authority of Jesus resulted in them losing the legitimacy of the spiritual authority. The moment they rejected Jesus, the son, that's it. <coughs> Gone. You have no more authority. And the whole parable is reminding of the historical and repeated violence of the Jewish authorities throughout history and how they reject God's prophets. When they rejected God's prophets again and again, they were rejecting God's authority because God sent the prophets. And now here we find Jesus giving a prediction that I <coughs> will be rejected. My rejection will culminate in this violent death where he himself will die. And we know that happened on the cross. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, will die. And what we know is interesting because if you look at it carefully, what he says is, you know, about the capstone and things, it is quoting Psalm 118, verse 22 to 23. That is known as a messianic psalm. And he knew this is a psalm talking about the Messiah. So Jesus is very blunt. He's saying, this is me. <laughs> This is what you're doing. It's like what we call the final straw that breaks the camel's back. There's no more hope now. So their loss of spiritual authority happens. That's it. But I want you to know something interesting because now these are issues of, of things are not so clear, black and white. Some, many, some people say, well, they lost their spiritual authority. They never had it in the first week because, you know, that's not God's way, you know, have all this counsel and things. People get appointed, you know. How, you know who, who are you to appoint people? and so on. Uh, that's the problem, but it's not due to organizational structure. I want to bring it up. 
side view because of the last adult Bible class, we talked about that uh, on the church, and we looked at the fact that there are various historical, the ways churches structure. It's not that when you vote or appoint a leader, <coughs> you're wrong. You notice that Jesus never, never <coughs> condemned the structure of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish religious council. He never did that. And if you look at history of our churches, you notice that we all have our views. I have my view of what's the possibly the most biblical and accurate structure. But every one of them has different views, right? Everyone has different positions. And in whatever history we consider the very best biblical church structure, we also notice many of those churches have problems of spiritual authority and leaders that are sinful. And the churches break up, they have all kinds of problems, even though they're the best structure. And likewise, a church that some will consider, hey, this is the worst and most unbiblical church structure, not the greatest, okay, at all. We actually have how many, many people who are spiritual leaders who are wonderful and they were godly and the churches strived. <coughs> so it's not so much about structure. So Jesus was critical of this group of people that represent the Jewish religious council. But notice there were godly members in the council. Have you noticed that? Remember a guy called Joseph Arimathea? We read in the Gospel of John. He was actually a member of this council, and he was a godly man. He is the man who went up there to Pilate and said, give me the body of Jesus. I will give him the proper right burial. And he put him in his own tomb. And he was a rich man, so it's not as it maybe people say, oh, he bought power. No, he was a godly man. Remember in John 2, there's a guy called Nicodemus, Pharisee, who came to Jesus at night because he was scared of everybody. <coughs> but he really was came to talk to Jesus and he wanted to understand. And Jesus really, you can see that the way Jesus treated him because he was a genuine seeker. And Jesus taught him about things about being born again and stuff. And so we see they were good people. Look at the early church. Jesus appointed 12 disciples, right? And later he appointed Paul as his apostles. And what happened? You find in turn the apostles appointed disciples like Timothy and Titus, we read in the Bible, and also Peter appointed Mark as his main disciples. Some of them, we find in the Bible, like Timothy and elder, uh, Titus, along with the apostles, what did they do? They appointed elders in churches. And even Mark, we read this gospel because Mark, who wrote this gospel, was Peter's close disciple and co-worker. He was like his main man. <coughs> And so when he could write it, because he had all the blessings of Peter and all the authority to write it. So it's not so much about structure. So when you keep that in mind, it's a very complicated thing. But Jesus is looking now at their attitudes. And this is important. So I want to just point out three signs from this passage that warn us if a person may be losing his or her spiritual authority. And it applies to all of us who say, hey, I would like to be a church leader. I want to serve. I want to be in leadership in this ministry or that ministry. We need to look at ourselves and say, uh, <coughs> great, but how do we measure up to these signs? Are we this way or that way? And again, remember, I'm saying my focus here is attitudes that actually become actions. I'm not talking about biblical theology. That's a different issue, okay? I'm not talking about biblical knowledge. And so three questions to ask are this. Do we seek to serve or seek to be served? It's simply about humility versus pride. <coughs> I'll get down to details a bit later. Are we concerned, the second one is, with what God thinks or what others think? Is it about popularity? Is it, do we focus on God or do we focus on a man? And the third one is simply this. Do we choose honesty and even risk embarrassment because we don't know, <laughs> or dishonesty, so we don't lose face. It's about whether we choose to live with integrity or actually choose to live with deception. In other words, accept that dishonesty is an acceptable part of our lives. That's okay. That's the question. <laughs> so let's look at the three signs. Remember I said it applies to me as the pastor, it applies to our church, it applies to all of us who seek to serve to be in ministry. Here are the three things. The first one is, principle is this, the sign is this, we will actually lose the suffer or loss of spiritual authority 
when we are more interested in being honoured by others than serving others. And this is where I get it from. Remember the few, few sermons before Mark chapter 10, verse 42 to 45, which I mentioned that for the gospel, that is the change, the pivotal point right in the middle, and then suddenly it changes, and then everything moves forward to the death of Christ and, and the, the whole purpose. Before that, it was just building up. And this is what he says. This part is Jesus' response to his disciples in fighting. You see, because they all wanted to be honoured, because, hey, we are his disciples, you know, so we are the inner circle. We are Jesus' main people. Who's greater? And that was the issue, because I want to be honoured, you know, when we know my kingdom, you know, Lord, I want to be there. Give me this, this role. That's what they were looking for. And this is what he says here. Let me read to you. And Jesus called them to him, and he said to them, you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentile authority, right, lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. See? So for authority. Then he says, but it shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant. Whoever must, would be first among you must be the slave of all. And then he hits this big kicker. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The principle he was putting is, is we don't lord it over. Exercise authority over others and say, we are, we, I am the pastor, shut up and listen. You know that kind of thing? I make the rules. I am the man. I am the Lord. So that kind of, no, no, it doesn't work that way. He said, you need to be a servant following Christ, our master's example. That is a powerful thing. <coughs> And now I want you to compare it in Mark chapter 11, verse 28. Look at how these people viewed authority. They were there for good reasons. They were supposed to know God. They know God's word. You know, they were supposed to be respected by the people. And it was supposed to be examples because they were the top. This is what they said. They just look at it. Read it aloud. It will make sense more to you. And they said to him, to Jesus, by what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority to do them? Can you see what's happening here? It's a demonstration of their pride. And it's using intimidation, really. Our position as religious leaders of the highest ruling council. By what authority do you do this? It's intimidation. And I'm sure you've seen it before. Examples in the world, in Christendom. That's what happens. Something's there, you ask... What authority do it? And then, oh, I'm sorry. You know, you, you get coward because the big boss is saying it. <coughs> of course, it didn't work for Jesus. I mean, he's not intimidated. Compare the two, really. You can see now Jesus is about humility and service. These guys were about keeping and demonstrating their honored status and power. And it is very, very hard. <coughs> I will tell you that most people who serve in any capacity in church, any church, will feel sometimes very discouraged, right? Is that people just don't appreciate what we're doing, right? And, and we get that. <clears throat> and you, sometimes you feel sorry for yourself and saying, why am I doing all this? I know it happens to me often when this, well, I wouldn't bring because I don't want and something else to change the church. And I feel, wow, you know, not really appreciated. But that's the point. <coughs> Why should it be? It is good to honour and respect, but to demand it is different, right? And that's what they were demanding. The second one is this. We will suffer a loss in spiritual authority when we are more concerned with what others think rather than what God thinks. Remember Jesus' words? <coughs> it's going to come up <laughs> in a couple, of month, a couple of sermons from now. He said this. He keeps repeating this throughout the Gospels. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. That's what he's telling. Because that's Jesus' focus. You love God. You focus on God. You do what He thinks. You do what He wants you to do. That's the way He lives. <coughs> do you remember what happened when Jesus was baptized? This is my beloved son, the voice from God said, whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. 
I'm very pleased with him <coughs> because he's doing the will of God. That's Jesus' focus for us, loving God, focusing on God. Remember what he thinks, what he wants us to do. But compare this to Mark chapter 11, that passage 32 and 33. He says this, but shall we say from men, is the question they're asking, hmm, they were afraid of the people for they all held that John was really a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we don't know. See, their focus was what the crowd taught, not what God taught. They were afraid of the people's high opinion of John the Baptist. But it's very clear they didn't like him because the things he, he, he said really riled them up. <clears throat> but because of popular opinion, they tried to find ways to get rid of him, but they didn't want to openly confront. Jesus knew it. And anybody who actually could see the situation knew that they didn't like him. But they refused to say so publicly because people will listen and hear and then they will lose popularity and then maybe next round they won't get voted in or whatever. That's the problem. They wanted to stay in power. So compare the two now. Jesus is about focusing on pleasing God. They were focusing on pleasing man to stay in power. This... <coughs> In summary, is church politics. It happens all over the world, all through history. That's not what we want, right? And so when we find that we have that thing happening, then we know that we are actually losing spiritual authority before God because we are playing that game. We shouldn't. Third one is this. We will, lose a, we will suffer a loss in our spiritual authority when we choose dishonesty rather than truthfulness. Now, this is a bit more specific. <clears throat> now, next week, you'll, you'll be doing through Mark chapter 12, verse 14, and it is really the related to issues of politics. And <laughs> okay? So, it's very interesting. You will see that being truthful is part of who Jesus is, and that's part of his reputation. And they actually try to use his reputation of always being truthful, straight as it is, to trap him. And this is what it says in Chapter 12, verse 14. And they came and said to him, to Jesus, Teacher, we know that you are true and you do not care about anyone's opinion. For you are not swayed by appearances, but truly teach the way of God. You see, they knew it. That's Jesus. And then, of course, they asked this tricky question. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay them or should we not? His reputation is such. Now compare it to what we just read, Mark chapter 11, verse 32 and 33. We read it a few times. They not only did they lie, but when you read the Gospels, you see they constantly were doing things. They were scheming. They were plotting evil. All the time you read, it keeps coming up in the so-called name of good. <coughs> it's what people say that, does the ends justify the means? We want this good outcome, but we're willing to cheat and, and be dishonest to get it. I don't think God approves. <coughs> Compare the two again. Jesus lived by, by what? Jesus is the truth, and he lived according to the truth, and he had integrity. In other words, his whole life, because integrity means it's, it's all, you know, all the pieces fit together well. And these guys, they were just not just dishonest in lying to Jesus, but they were not seeking the truth. They were so used to dishonesty, they became part of their life and they lived a life of deception. That is the scary part. We don't realize it. If we, that this actually erodes spiritual authority that God has given if we are constantly lying. You think about what's happening in cases. <coughs> Someone asked me, Pastor, what do you think of this, this, these things? There's a huge pressure sometimes, you know, to give the right answer. Oh yeah, I know. But you notice among us and the leaders in church and that, we don't know. <laughs> what? You should know. Some people tell me, you're supposed to be the... If I don't know, I don't know. <coughs> you lose face, you know, you lose reputation. This guy doesn't understand. He doesn't know. Is that so wrong? But often, you see, we, people will do it and say that they will give a thing. This is what it is they know, but actually they don't. And then sometimes they lie our way through it. So we look good. 
And if we think that is to help the, the appearance so people have confidence in the leader or whatever it is, we actually find we're actually losing the spiritual authority before God is eroding it. <coughs> think about it. So summary, very quickly. Some helps in keeping our spiritual authority, and maybe I would say growing in spiritual authority. First of all, it's very clear throughout the scripture part here. Jesus is our final authority. It is Jesus. <coughs> the moment we take our eyes off Jesus, we don't listen to him, we don't obey him, we don't try to model after him, authority is gone. Why? Authority, spiritual authority comes from God, from Jesus. If it means, also means we obey what the prophets say, what the apostles say, Old Testament, New Testament, you read, we understand we obey. It's the Bible because God said, I'm mean, sending all these prophets to you. But you ignore them, then we're in trouble. Okay, that's the first sign. We don't really care about what Jesus thinks or says. What this Bible says, problem. But the three parts here that come up, again, we need to focus on serving and not being served. If we become a position where we, we want everybody to honour us and you know, do things for us, bit of a problem. <coughs> not to say we don't allow. That's very arrogant. I don't need your help. We all need help. But here's the thing. Is it about service or is it about being served? That will help us because it involves humility and not pride to want to serve. The second one, remember, is focusing on pleasing God, not others. Now, this is very hard, isn't it? We're talking about how this work. But bottom line is, if we really focus on learning to love God first, eventually we're going to love others better. That's what God says. We're able to speak the truth and love even though it hurts and people get upset. <laughs> but that's it. Focus on pleasing God, not others. The third one, focus on speaking the truth. Learning to live with integrity, not with deception. I will tell you, it is very, very hard. I try to be consistent and sometimes it's just not. It's quite easy, really, to tell a little white lie to get away. I mean, <coughs> simple things I've, I've, people have done, which I know, you won't know people think. Okay, think about it this way. Pastor, can you come over to do this Bible study, this group thing? Um, oh, no, actually, I'm sorry, I've got an appointment and you, you know, very private, you, you, I, I, can't, I can't do it. Actually, I'm just tired. But it looks good, right? Just get something on It's very hard, but often I just say, look, I'm just too tired. Sorry. It's not emergency, I'm just too tired. But you're supposed to be, you know, you feel very bad because you want to be, you know, respected and loved by everyone. Simple as that, but you see, but by defaulting to telling the truth, you may disappoint, but before God, and that. i tell you how important this is, one personal story. <laughs> Many of you know that my, my father was very anti-Christian. He hated the idea. He hated it. And, and he would give me a lot of problems with it. <coughs> and my father, before he became a Christian, <coughs> one of the problems he had was he had a drinking problem. And half the time, he, he couldn't go to work because he was actually drunk, hangover. Okay? And he was a very powerful person. They, they let him get away with it because he was so good at his job. And, and one of his friends told me, <coughs> people under him before, but now became he's in the army, become his superior. He said, you know, your dad, uh, even when he's drunk half the time, uh, he does three, four times the amount of work and better than people who are fully sober. <coughs> That's why we let him get away, we cover for him. <laughs> That's an amendment. Now, my dad will always tell me things that happen. The phone rings and home, I'm young. If that's for me, tell him, <coughs> tell him I'm, I'm not home. I'm out. He's at home. I'll pick up the phone and I'll say, um, <coughs> Sorry, my father's not available. Uh, could you call back later? And then, okay, and then we're going to take a message, put the phone down. And my father will come to me and say, he will curse me, he will swear at me and say, don't try to be funny. I said, I am not home. No, I'm not available. You better do as I say. He would repeat, do it again and again, I will say. And he just wanted to hit me. You, you know, I, what do you think you are? I don't try to be funny. I said, I am not home. You say, I am not home. So I said, for my father, come, come to the phone right now. 
He kept going on for weeks. He was so angry. But you know, later when he became a Christian, this, when he sat down with me one night, <coughs> before I became, just before I became a Christian, after drinking at three in the morning, we sat down in the house and he was just telling me things. I hate all these things, but I respect the fact that you just refuse to lie. And before that, he let me go to Bible seminary. You know why? He said this. I said that, if I want to serve God, I want to go to Bible seminary. He was angry. Stupid job, social parasite, all that kind of stuff. I said, okay. Um, I feel, believe that's what God wants me to do. And I won't do it unless you give me your blessing. <laughs> and this was a crux. He said, go. Useless anyway because... You're never going to make it in the world because you don't know how to lie, you don't know how to cheat. How are you going to do it in business? How are you going to do it? Just go and be a stupid pastor kind of thing. That's what he told me. He didn't realize that was a compliment. It was so hard. So I'm not trying to say I'm great. I will still mess up. I'll still make mistakes and you know, try to find a good way out. But that's simple. And that's where spiritual authority comes from. So think about all these three things. And the last thing to consider is this. And then I end. Have you noticed that if you look through the Bible, these Pharisees, these really scribes, these uh, priests, religious leaders, they were actually very intelligent. They were very intelligent. They could tell that Jesus was talking about it. They could understand things and they knew their Bibles inside out, so to speak. But you notice something? For Jesus, that wasn't important criteria for spiritual authority. You notice how difficult it was. Remember when you read Acts, when the apostles began to preach and things, and what was the things they said about them, the disciples? Where did they get all this authority? Where did they get all this from? They speak with such a thing. They are unschooled. They are authority. They are fishermen. They are, you know, they kind of think they are, they are no bodies. How come they know all? How come they have this? It comes from only God. Think about that. And let us pray. Father, thank you that you love us. <coughs> you always help us. You promise to do so. Thank you for so many in our church who have taken up <coughs> leadership positions. Some are official and some are not. But Lord, we know we lead, they lead and we follow because they have spiritual authority in their lives. And we ask you to help us, Lord, those of us who wish to lead and who are leading. Help us to keep Jesus as our final authority, to always look to what you say, what your Bible says. Help us to learn to focus on serving, for that's your model. We are shepherds under the great shepherd. Help us not to be so too concerned about being honoured and to be served. If everyone serves, Lord, we know, Lord, that it will be such a wonderful place because we can't outdo serving one another. Help us too to focus on pleasing you and not others. We know it is very, very hard. At times, we have this pressure. But Lord, we believe and trust, Lord, that if we serve you, we look to you, you will help us. And actually, Lord, in the end, we can please and love others because you love us and we are willing to love you. Help us to learn to speak the truth. That's so hard nowadays. <coughs> White lies are part of our lives. And even if we do so, help us to ask for forgiveness and get up and move again forward. Help us, Lord, to let deception be part of our life, dishonesty be just who we are, little things we do. If we get so used to being dishonest, it will affect our lives. So help us to keep a clean slate before you. You are the way, the truth, and the life. The truth sets us free, Lord. So help us, Lord, to live by the truth. We ask this, your help, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.